Sandra Hirsch. And I'm Jim Carney. And this is EdCast. A program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. Join us today for a conversation with City University Chancellor Matthew Goldstein as the Chancellor discusses the challenges facing the university today. In his over one decade at the helm of CUNY, he's seen a lot of changes in public education and in the City University of New York. We'll begin our conversation right after this. Our guest today is City University Chancellor Matthew Goldstein. Thank you for joining us on EdCast. Pleasure to be here. We're particularly proud that you're here in our new multimedia studio. It's a great facility yeah, for Yeah, as I was walking down the stairs, I said, what a fabulous looking place. When did all of this happen? Oh, it's, it's brand new, and yeah, our students great. are getting the advantage of it. So it's, it's wonderful great. to have you here. That's great. It's wonderful to Jens be here. Jens these are recognizably trying times for public education. What do you see as the major challenge facing CUNY today? Well, you know, it's not just CUNY. It's a national problem. Uh, you may know that a few weeks ago, we brought to New York about 28 of the, le of the top CEOs in public higher education across the United States. The one theme that was pounded away over and over again, which is symptomatic of what we're experiencing in New York, is that there's a regression away of supporting public higher education. And I think that really has to change. We really need to have an inflection point uh, over 80 percent of the students that study in the United States study at public universities and public colleges and I think we have to ensure that these institutions stay vibrant and exciting and relevant and if we continue to see reductions in our operating support move in the wrong way I think it compromises the ability of students to get the kind of experience that all of us want them to get. Well, how, how is CUNY addressing those ch particular challenges to well, stay vibrant? Well, you know, in the last three years, we have lost about $350 million in our operating budget, which is a considerable amount of money. We have had to reimagine how we support the ongoing needs of the university in an environment of shrinking resources. And so we are trying to promote, as I have been trying to promote for 10 years, a rational policy for tuition rather than the helter-skelter approach that has been uh, experienced in New York for too long a period of time. We have created real efficiencies, uh, new business practices, operating more smartly, reshaping our budgets as we can, putting philanthropy much more as a leading variable in, uh, in, in the way in which we generate revenue, being much more entrepreneurial and utilizing the university's you know, deep intellectual resources in play with the marketplace. Those are the things that we need to do in order to keep the, the ship afloat. But at the end of the day, we can't have a continuing hemorrhage of, of resources. We need to stabilize our resources and then grow incrementally. We know you spoke with the uh, Citizens Budget Commission today, and you really emphasize the value of public education and why it may be short-sighted to not fund CUNY and public education in general. Could you speak a little bit about that, about why it's short-sighted not to? Well, I actually use a metaphor uh, and um, it, it's an extreme metaphor and, and that I think it's a national security issue for us. Mm. I really believe that if we continue to not support public higher education, giving uh, the students, not giving the students an ability to really realize their fullest potential, we're going to lose our competitiveness. If you travel, I know your president, Ricardo Fernandez, uh, here at Lehman College, who is a dear friend of mine and does great work at Lehman and has done it for a long time, travels the world as I have uh, traveled the world. We both see what other countries are doing in supporting public higher education, whether it's the Gulf states, whether it's uh, East Asia, whether it's Asia, whether it's Latin America, whether it's Europe, there is a theme that is permeating all continents around the world 
that a knowledge economy is going to require an educated citizenry. And unless we understand that we have to do the same, we're going to be compromised. Our standard of living is not going to be what all of us want it to be, in part because we're not going to be as competitive. So I think it's a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. um, how is CUNY specially positioned to address some of these issues, such as the partnerships that you, you briefly addressed before and the entrepreneurial endeavors that uh, CUNY is going to engage in? We have a myriad of relationships with businesses and government uh, providing services and uh, consulting uh, services in particular uh, to companies. I mean, one of the really interesting new developments at CUNY is working with uh, the international business machine, IBM, uh, on a very, very exciting prog uh, program to digitize uh, textbooks. Textbooks are becoming so expensive, they're becoming out of reach for so many of our students. We're working with Stuyvesant High School now. Digitizing is easy. You can put all of this up in a cloud someplace and then bring it down. But what's hard is to develop the material to support the textbooks. And what we hope to do in this relationship with Stuyvesant is know how to do it well and then market it to school systems all over the country. So we see this as a business plan uh, to do it. We have a, a new energy institute. We, <coughs> we uh, uh, recruited Sanjoy Banerjee, who's one of the world's leading experts in energy. We recruited him from the University of California at Santa Barbara. He's joined us and in just a short period of time has developed relationships with lots of businesses. and So it's really intellectual <coughs> capital. Uh, so much of what we do is breaking the silo between a university and the communities in which we serve, whether it's businesses, whether it's government, local and state government, whether it's not-for-profit. People want to use CUNY as a, um, a, an assister to uh, uh, for the work that they do. I know that uh, on the graduate level, the School of Journalism has wonderful mm. relationships with the prof professional journalism environment with partnerships mm -hmm. with CBS and New York Times. And it, it's uh, a benefit for our students to have that sort of relationship with professional organizations like those. And it's, and it's consistent with the mission of the City University of New York. Not only do we educate, but we also create knowledge but we bring that knowledge into the marketplace. And I like to take it one step further, bring it, the knowledge into the marketplace and get paid for it right. <laughs> because we need the resources. Now, we've also noticed, of course, that the community colleges are really gaining prominence in the national conversation. President Obama has referred to the importance of community colleges. Why do you think they are becoming the focal point of conversation? You know, we, uh, in, in fairness to CUNY, we were really out in front of this argument for uh, some time. And, and, and I tell the following story, which is absolutely true, that I woke up one night uh, and my, my wife said to me, why are you walking, <laughs> you know, around? Go to sleep. And I said, I have something on my mind. And I was thinking about community colleges why the graduation rates are so low, what is it that we could do. I, I got an appointment with the mayor, told him about uh, the problem. He was sympathetic. He put some serious money into this effort. Uh, and it was about graduation rates and understanding that so many of the students that study at community colleges have such complex lives. Right. And not knowing much about community colleges, it was easy for me to think about how one may approach the problem. He bought in. We brought the idea back to our faculties at CUNY. They shaped it. We then created a program. We, sh we saw that graduation rates could skyrocket. And I'm not, I don't have the time here to go into all of the details. But from that, we scaled it up by establishing a new community college based on the principles that we learn from this uh, set of ideas. Forty-five percent of the students that study at universities in the United States study at community colleges. Twenty percent of the doctorates that were conferred in, 1998, in 2008 
at universities in the United States were from students that started at a community college. As I said this morning, it is a forgotten asset class in higher mm -hmm. education, and we need to spend a lot more time thinking about how to make community colleges more effective, how we make them more responsive to the needs of students and connected with the marketplace, and we are doing that. Obama, President Obama, has picked up on that theme as well, not from me. <laughs> he had it independently, Arne Duncan, Secretary of Education. Community colleges are in play, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. And what do you think they provide, I'm, so that our viewers who are watching may not be thinking about why the community colleges become so important? You mentioned the, the large numbers of students who go there. What do you think they offer these students, that they may, those students who may not be going right into a senior college? Unfortunately, too many students that are graduating from secondary school today are just not ready well, for we universities. We know the sobering statistics. Big, yeah. big article today <laughs> yes. in the New York Times, right. study commissioned by the State Education yes. Department in the regions, mm -hmm. shows an appallingly small percentage of students that graduate from high schools in New York State are not ready for the rigors of what a collegiate experience will require. That must be a tremendous uh, challenge then for CUNY. It's a tremendous, and we know this, right. we've known this for some time. This is not new to us right. because we take the students. Community colleges are really the first face, the, the initial conditions under which students experience um, university life. And so that's why I think they're so important. They do, as part of their very basic mission, they take students who are not prepared uh, for college level work and remediate those deficiencies and keep them engaged and then send them on if that's what they want to do or remediate the deficiencies and give them skills that the marketplace rewards. So I think those are just so fundamental in keeping the society vibrant. And CUNY is well placed. We have some really fine community colleges that can really We have wonderful those community needs. colleges with great faculty, great presidents, and we're all moving in the same direction. A part of uh, the economy we talked about earlier, but uh, in down times when people lose their, their jobs, they make a decision to go back to school. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing a lot of people coming back to CUNY or into CUNY uh, for training, for retraining, and for changing careers? CUNY is experiencing record enrollment. It's experiencing record enrollment, I would believe, for two reasons. One, the burnishing of the reputation of CUNY. People see this as a place to get a value degree. That's great. But the economy has been so dreadful <laughs> in the past three years that people cannot find jobs and they need to be retooled. And CUNY is a place where they are coming to to retrain, to experience new career opportunities, and we see this as a very basic mission for us. Uh, I know that um, many of the CUNY campuses have already been involved and are continuing to be involved in the Foundations of Excellence program, the John Gardner Institute, which is really a way of making sure that that first year experience, be it for uh, a freshman or even a transfer student into the university, that they're given a really positive experience or a way of really being ready to go on to either finish the community college or transfer on to the senior college. So we really have a lot of things in place and in play mm -hmm. to really get our students ready. When we talk a lot about careers and technology and the focus of the university preparing students and what makes us wonder, um, what do you feel is the role of the humanities today? in terms of education. I am a big liberal <laughs> arts and science so smiling guy. When I, ask I really am. You're I, in that same I mean, I, <laughs> if I had my wish, I would get away with majors and allow students to really immerse themselves in an exploratory journey. I mean, when I, I studied mathematics, but the most, the courses that I really embraced when I was at CCNY were literature classes, music classes, philosophy right. classes that I typically would not think about. But when I think about the professors I had and the interest in reading, and I'm a big reader, it really started with those experiences with faculty. I'm a big opera fan. I never understood or went to an opera when I was a kid, but I did 
experienced the opera once when I was with um, a, a course in 20th century American music. I did go to the opera. Mm -hmm. My friends were wise guys in the <laughs> class, and they whispered to the professor, Matthew went to the opera last night. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the professor said to me, so what did you think? So what did you think? <laughs> and I thought I would die, and I said, well, I think the, the tenor was weak. <laughs> Not having a clue what I was saying. And the professor looked at me and said, I agree with you. I was there too, and it was weak. And I said, wow, that and was that good. emboldened you from then on. So I, I believe deeply in the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences. Unfortunately today, too many students around the United States are just so career oriented. And if you ask a student today, why did they go to college? It's about wanting to get a job. And it has to be balanced. So how do we balance that in our own university? Is there a way that we can balance that for students? I mean, I know it's a fast-paced digital world, but is there a way that we can Well, I think we that? need to take general education very seriously uh, at both our, our baccalaureate institutions and our associate degree programs. And that's where students really get the first experience into literature, into the arts, uh, into the social sciences. And I think we have to do a good job. We have to, you know, this is not a, um, an experience that they bemoan that they have to experience. This is something we ought to try to get them excited about. If someone wakes up and, and wants to be an accountant, by the, ten, by the time they're eight or nine years old, and then takes a poetry class <laughs> and says, you know, I want to do something else, I think that's a good thing. Even if we lost an accountant. Even if we <laughs> lost an accountant. We had Roosevelt yeah. Montas on the program from Columbia University, and he talked mm -hmm. about the value of the humanities, and yeah. his basic point was, I think, that the humanities help us answer the question, what it means to be human, and that that's something that all of our students should be thinking think about and that right. the kinds of thinking that you have to mm -hmm. do in the humanities right. can make us better as citizens. Mm -hmm. right. Well, you've been on the job now for over a decade. Yes. Look, looking back, what, what are some of your proudest accomplishments in that decade at CUNY? Really knowing that as chancellor you can make a difference. You can make things happen. Uh, I was very proud to go to CCNY. Me too. I had lots of opportunities <laughs> graduate. for private universities. I just had no money. And so CCNY really opened up my eyes to a wider world that I didn't know. I mentioned the opera. I mentioned literature. I mentioned mathematics. These were things that really inspired me. I want to be able to give that opportunity for students who, like myself, were clueless when I went to City College. And so for me, making people be excited about CUNY again, and so many people lost respect for where the university was, creating a value degree, giving students a real opportunity to realize their fullest potential, that to me was, is the most rewarding experience uh, in the job as chancellor. Uh, we have a Macaulay intern who asked us to ask you one question. Um, yes. What do you see the difference in the university from when you were an undergraduate as it is today? It's a much bigger, much more complex place. When I went to, well, CUNY didn't exist. There were just right. a few federation of campuses. We were small. There was no diversity, very little diversity. That's true. Uh, to me, it's a much more exciting place today. We want to thank you so much for joining us today on EdCast. It really was a pleasure. Pleasure to see you. It's been great to have you here. We thank really you. appreciate it. Happy we'll be back here. right after this. After our studio conversation, Chancellor Goldstein walked across the Lehman campus to meet with the faculty and staff of the college. So uh, without any further ado, let me introduce Matthew Goldstein, CUNY Chancellor, good friend. <laughs> So let me just uh, start by saying that, uh, and this is, this is true, I never say this at another campus. I'm going on a road trip. Uh, I did this about three or four years ago where I visited every campus and just made myself available to answer questions. I'm not here really to make a speech. I do enough of that. But 
what I always say when I come to this campus is that there, there's something about the karma of this campus that you get a sense that serious work goes on at Lehman College. I mean, just the beauty of the architecture, the way that the campus is laid out. So for me, it's always a joy to walk on this campus. And I just did a quick television show with, um, at, at your media center, which is really fabulous, Ricardo. And just walking across campus, again, gave me that sense of this is really a very special place. And it's, it's wonderful to be here. And, and it's wonderful to be with um, my friend, Ricardo Fernandez, who I think has been an extraordinary president and has really taken this important institution and, and moving it uh, a little further. We're going through a tough time in uh, public higher education. I mentioned this this morning, again, in a speech I gave to the uh, Citizens Budget Commission, and it's largely policy people uh, concerned about matters of finance. And I had indicated that um, in early November, at an invitation I had um, tendered to about 28 of the top CEOs in public higher education, and they all came to New York for a two-day summit on public higher education. And it followed something that we had done, uh, I guess, three years before, um, where a similar group, but a smaller group, uh, came. And as we were discussing the issues that we're all facing, there was one commonality that permeated and coursed through our discussion, and that is that there is an unrelenting regression away for support of public higher education going on in the United States today. We have some budget problems. Uh, as a result of the budget that was proposed by our new governor, that now that budget is remanded for consideration, review, and change in the state legislature. Obviously, we're going to be very uh, seriously involved uh, in, in those discussions. Uh, I want to assure all of you that it is not at the level uh, where anybody should be really frightened about jobs. Uh, this is not about retrenchment or anything near that, but it is a serious chipping away of the seed corn that we have planted for a number of years now that, are, that is being extracted out of the university. Just to put a face on this, with this last budget uh, that is presented, by the governor, we've lost about $350 million, which represents about 14% of uh, our resources. And the percentage of money that now supports our operating budget that is supported by the state of New York has diminished even further. So universities like CUNY are going to have to reimagine how they behave in the marketplace how we are going to find ways to keep the university vibrant and exciting so that when students come, they are given an opportunity to really transform their lives. I'm using elliptical language here, but I believe that that is the case, that students do come, they look to change their lives, and I can't think of a more noble thing uh, than to help them do that, but at the end of the day, we're going to need resources. This is a big university. We, our, our, our budget uh, at the City University today is hovering about $3 billion a year. When we think about everything that we expend, we're spending close to $3 billion a year just on the operating side and probably have in the pipeline close to $5 billion in um, in capital construction, and this campus is going to be the recipient of it. So we have some real challenges ahead. We have some academic challenges that are always the case with a university, but we have some real financial problems that we're going to have to work through, and we're not going to be able to work them through unless we stand back and take a fresh look 
at how public universities operate and how they're financed. Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. It seems test taking might actually be a way to learn something after all. The New York Times reports on research in the journal Science stating that students who read a passage and were tested on their recall retained about 50 percent more of the information than students who either spent a lot of time restudying the material or drawing detailed diagrams of what they were learning. None of the work reported here, however, resembled the high-stakes tests so prevalent today. Education Week reports on a study in the journal Child Development which indicates that social and emotional learning programs result in improved academics as well. Students who participated in these programs improved their grades and standardized test scores by 11 percentile points compared to non-participating students. These students also had greater social skills, less emotional stress, better school behavior, and a greater willingness to help other students. Studies indicate that full-time cyber schooling might only work for students whose parents have the time to be greatly involved in their education. Research shows that parental supervision and support is critical to student success in online learning, something that might be difficult for full-time working parents. Compared to traditional schools, cyber schooling requires parents to take attendance, see the activities are completed, and generally help with the curriculum. Some virtual schools expect parents to spend 20 hours a week working with their children. E-learning advocates are seeking ways to help parents handle these demands, including part-time on-site schooling with mentors. In the past, we've reported on concerns that the language of text messages with its digital slang might result in a generation of kids who can't spell. But there are new studies that indicate that text messaging might actually make kids better spellers. How is this possible, you might be asking? New research indicates that texting means that students are exposed to language and language play, and this results in greater fluency. It also seems that students do understand the differences between academic and texting language and know when to use each, alleviating another teacher concern. LOL. Well, that does it for this edition of EdCast. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, class dismissed.